Here's a quick joke for you to give an example. A man walks into a shop in Chinatown and finds a brass rat. Have you heard this? Finds a brass rat and asks, asks the shopkeeper how much for the brass rat. And the guy says, $10 for the brass rat and $10,000 for the story behind the rat. And he says, I'll just pay the $10. And he pays $10 and takes the rat. He's walking down the street. These rats start coming out of the gutter and start following him. They start chasing him. Finally, he has to start running. The rats are running after him. He climbs up the telephone pole. The rats are chewing on their way up the pole, going after him. So finally, as a desperate movie, he takes the rat and throws it out into the harbor. All the rats dive after the brass rat and drown. So the man goes back to the shop, and the shopkeeper says, I guess you want to buy that story now, huh? And he says, no, I want to see if you have any brass lawyers. Now, it's not, the, not a great joke, but uh, how would you ruin the joke? How do you ruin a joke? I do this with artworks, too. The way you would ruin that joke is by explaining, you know, do you have any brass lawyers? Because you see, I had some problems with a lawyer. I went through a bad divorce. You know, you start spelling it out, then you ruin the joke. The, the, the jump just has to be immediate. You can't spell out any of the reasons for that happening. And uh, the same works in the case of any joke, I would say. So it's better, you need to leave them implicit. Um, I would also say that paradigms in science, Thomas Kuhn has, has fallen out of fashion in philosophy of science, as far as I can tell, because his, his, you know, he talks about paradigm shifts. He says that changes in science don't happen because of rigorous arguments they happen. The, par the paradigm suddenly shifts. And this is often interpreted in sociological terms to mean that there are non-scientific or non-cognitive reasons why the paradigm shifts, and therefore it's something extra scientific that makes science move. I don't read it that way at all. I read the, the paradigm shift in science as being a difference between the scientific object and the qualities of that object that are measured by normal science. So in other words, uh, the paradigm shift happens when the object is rethematized for science, and that object is never stated fully in any of the properties we know about it. That object also... Uh, as, as Fire Robin points out, they're contra they're always, there's always experiments contradicting every, any given theory at any moment. Theories are always falsified at any given moment. There's always contrary evidence that simply can't be assimilated, and we don't throw out the theory for that reason. But at a certain point, it builds up and we change theories. Anyway, um, this is why I think reality has to be constructed and not discovered. You can never get back to the reality outside of our observation of it. Discovery would require direct access to the things in one of two ways. Either you believe there's direct access to the thing unproblematically, as in mathematism, as in Meosu's philosophy, where the primary things, the primary qualities of things can be known by mathematizing them, or in principle, as in, for example, Kant, where the science can't get the exact properties of the thing, but it can get closer, kind of asymptotic approach, or in Brassier's philosophy now. We're getting, he said this in Bonn this summer. Um, there's a difference for Brassier between the scientific image of things and the manifest image of things. And he admits that you can never get to the scientific image of things, but he says it's a telos that you're approaching slowly, gradually. Now, whereas I don't think it can be an image at all. I don't think the reality isn't a scientific image or any other kind of image whatsoever. It's a reality. So that leaves the postmodernist position and the position I'm defending. Well, for the postmodernist position, reality can't be discovered because there is no reality outside of the, the play of signifiers and uh, whoever, whoever this postmodernist is, you know the type, right? You know the type of thinker this refers to. For me, there is an independent reality. It simply cannot be discovered. It's more like a mountain that you can mine minerals from, but you can never, you can never represent it before the mind. You can never say, there's a tree out there and I'm copying the tree in my mind, because the tree is not the kind of thing you can copy. The tree is a reality. It is an autonomy. It has certain effects that my knowledge of the tree does not have. My knowledge of the tree does not grow fruit. It does not strike roots in the ground. It does not fall during lightning strikes and so forth. So there's an absolute rift between the reality and any kind of knowledge of it. So therefore, it cannot be discovered. It can only be produced. Now, let me pivot here and talk about art. And perhaps the best foothold for doing that is to talk about Heidegger's origin of the work of art for just a minute. It's one of the more commonly cited philosophical essays on art, at least in the 20th century. Heidegger says that art is the strife of earth and world, which he later changes to earth and sky. Strife. Um, the earth is what hides. The world is, or the sky is what becomes visible to us. And the art is a, is a strife between those two. And there are two problems with this, with Heidegger's origin of the work of art that I can see. One of them is that his earth is completely unified. It's not really split up into individual things. That's Heidegger mixes two distinct meanings of the ontological difference. The ontological difference for Heidegger is the difference between being and beings. 
And he uses that to do two pieces of work at the same time, and it causes confusion. The, the first piece of work it does is it, it differentiates between the hidden and the revealed. Being is what hides. Being is what never can become present. Beings are what are always present to consciousness. That's one meaning of the distinction. But the other me- distinction, which was unnecessary, is the distinction between one and many. So for Heidegger, being also has the meaning of a one. It's something that's not split into beings, not split into a plurality, whereas the realm of presence is where things split into a plurality. And this has led many of, uh, at least some of Heidegger's followers, such as Levinas, such as Nancy, to continue this metaphysics where the world itself is this giant lump or this whole that splits into parts only when the human encounters it, which I think cannot work. If the world is one, in itself, why would it break into parts just because we encountered it? And also, if the world is one, we would be part of that one too. So why would we have any separate right to encounter it? So there are just too many contradictions there. The world itself must already be broken into parts. It's not just the human mind that breaks into parts. It's not just relations that break into parts. The second problem is that strife is never really explained by Heidegger. I've tried to say there are tensions at all times between objects and their qualities. The four different kinds of tensions between objects and their qualities. But strife has to be more than that, otherwise everything would be an artwork. So, how do we, how do we create tension between objects and their quality? How do we create visible tension between objects and their, their qualities, given that the tension is always there? Well, let me just point to something here on the, on the diagram again. The two that I've just colored in green work differently from the other two for the simple reason that both of them involve a sensual object rather than a real object. Look first at the one at the bottom. Uh, This is what I call time. Um, What do we mean by time? I mean, there's, there's a scientific interpretation of time. There's a metaphysical interpretation of time. But what we mean by our experience of time is the notion that things seem relatively more or less durable from one minute to the next, but they're changing, they're shifting somehow. They're shifting their properties. New objects are coming in to the room. Objects are going out. I'm leaving the room sometimes. I'm walking along the lake. But there's some, there's some stability. There's not a complete chaotic upheaval from one moment to the next. There are certain enduring units, objects, that last, yet they're changing their qualities. This is, this is really what we mean when we talk about an experience, the human experience of time. We're talking about uh, change within a stability. And this is constant. We're constantly experiencing time. The, the, the sensual objects, this is, right, this is before me, this is before me, this is before me. All these objects are here in the room at all times. No matter where I am, there's some objects around me, but they're constantly changing properties. Now, normally, we don't think about this too hard. There's a kind of bond between these two in experience. We don't think about it too hard. Phenomenology teaches us to create a rift, to drive a wedge between those two, because phenomenology is trying to teach us to forget, subtract away all these accidental features on the surface of the thing that are shimmering and glistening and try to get to the really essential features of the thing. And how do you, how do, you do that? Um, well, I think the, a general name for how we can do that is simulation. What are you doing when you simulate a thing? Well, you're assuming that you know the essential properties of a thing, you're drawing them up, you're putting them perhaps in a computer program, and then you're imagining that thing under all different sorts of circumstances that it never experienced. So you're, you're replaying World War II or the United States Civil War according to different scenarios, what, what would have happened if this had happened. When you're doing that, you're assuming counterfactually that you can grasp what the essential features of a thing were apart from what actually happened to it, and you can put those essential features in new circumstances. So you know, if, if Napoleon were were one of the French commanders in the Second World War, how would things have played out differently? What what strategies would he have used and so forth? Simulations. The other one uh, is what I think theory does, that diagonal green line, where you have the sensual object, any object that's appearing before the senses, and it has real qualities. Why are they real qualities and not sensual ones? Well, because they're hidden from us because they are important, because they stay the same, and because even Husserl admits you cannot grasp these in sensual experience. You cannot grasp the essence of an apple with your eyes. It's categorial. You have to use your mind to grasp what the real essence of the apple is. All the, all the qualities of the apple that you see through your senses are accidental, in other words, for Husserl. It's cognitive, the way you get at the, the essence, the ados of the apple. I use ados, the related Greek word, which is the term that, that Husserl uses. 
uh, and by theory, what we're doing is we're driving a wedge between a thing and its, its properties that it needs to be in order to be what it is. Now, it's different, I would say, with the other two, the ones I've left in black. You have the sensual quality and the real object, for example. And that's what I call space. Now, why do, you, why do we call that space? Well, what does space really mean? There's a famous debate about the philosophy of space between Leibniz and Clark. Clark was working for Newton. Uh, Clark and Newton think space is an empty container in which things move around. Leibniz argues that it has to be relational for several reasons. One reason being, could you move the whole universe 50 meters to the west? It wouldn't make any sense, right? Because there's nothing to compare it to then if you're moving the whole universe. And so therefore, uh, it's one of the reasons he gives that space is relational. Now, it seems to me that both of those are wrong. It seems to me that space has to be both relational and non-relational. Why? Well, because we are in relation to other things in space. I'm a measurable distance from Paris and Cairo and Tokyo, but I'm not touching them, so I'm at a certain distance from them. I am both related and not related to them. There's something in me that is withheld from those cities that is not exhausted by my relation to them, and yet I do have a certain connection with them that allows me to move towards them. So space is that tension between the real object, meaning me, and any of my relations or any of my sensual qualities, which are external to what I am. Heidegger's broken hammer can also be read as that diagonal line. This, uh, what happens when this, when this tension is highlighted? Unlike the, the two in green, where the, things, where the object is already connected with its qualities and they're split, the black lines, there is no connection and the connection is produced. So for example, what I mean is, it's not like the real hammer is accessible to us in, until it breaks and then there's a separation between the real hammer and the, the qualities I see of the hammer, the reverse happens in this case. The sensual qualities become stripped from the sensual hammer that I see or that I feel and become attached to this mythical real hammer that is not accessible. It's like a black hole. It's somewhere far away. I have very limited information about it. So if you think of the, the green lines as, as fission in atomic terms, you can think of the other two as fusion. That, that these two experiences, the black lines, are the kind that attach objects with qualities. And what's, what is the experience when that happens? I call that allure. Uh, and allure is related to the word illusion with an A. When something is alluring, it's because we don't quite have it, right? We want it. Something is tempting us. We're trying to get at something, but we can't. We can't grasp it. It's just out of reach. That's why I call it allure. And this is the axis along which I put artworks. What the difference is between artworks and broken hammers and other experiences of allure, I can't quite say. It's, that itself is elusive. But uh, this is where artworks belong. Uh, because you, are, you cannot exhaust an artwork by listing its qualities. To some, extent you, to some extent, you can exhaust a scientific object by listing its qualities. You could, in principle, get a complete description of a scientific object by listing all of its qualities. You can never do this with an artwork. You cannot take all the artworks out of a gallery and replace them with a prose description of you know, 100 pages even. You could do that as a deliberate Dadaist exercise, but you, you can't do that normally as a way of, of explaining the artwork. And incidentally, I think this is why there's room for criticism, not in the sense of critique, of being transcendent above things and critiquing the naivete of people, which is what critique usually means, like political critique. I'm cr critiquing the ideology of people, the, you know, the, the naive brainwashedness of people who are bewitched by commodity fetishism, and I, know, I alone know the real truth of how value of commodities is produced. That's, that's the usual sense of critique, where I am the superior one who is in the position of absolute knowledge, and I will debunk all those who are naive enough to believe in commodities or other things. No, there's another sense of criticism, namely uh, wine criticism, food criticism, art criticism. What do you see in these cases? You see someone who knows there's an object they can't quite get at, and they're using oblique, elusive, descriptive language to try to, to, try to tell you what the wine is like. It's a matter of taste. You can never know for sure that the wine taster has the qualities of the wine exactly right. You just learn to respect some people's taste more than others. Some people have better taste. There's a horrible essay by Daniel Dennett where he talks about replacing wine tasters by a machine that would measure the chemicals. And I um, wish I had it in front of me, but it's, the example he uses is something like um, a flamboyant and velvety pinois but lacking in stamina, which I think is perfectly good wine tasting potentially, if, if that's what the wine tastes like. And he wants to actually replace this by chemical formula and say that it will be just as good, that we can say that what that means chemically is this or that. This is the worst kind of reduction there is. I suppose he probably thinks you can do that with literary criticism as well, right? that you can replace 
uh, perhaps a good Shakespeare criticism with a brain scan of the reader as they're reading Shakespeare or something, right, to show which neural...